So we recently did a video talking all about headphone measurements and moving away from the Harman Target and moving to the fancy new Bruling Care 5128 measurement system and what that means. And I would encourage you guys to watch that video, but essentially we proposed a new target, a new standard reference point uh, that's based on diffuse field. Now, if you're totally new to headphone measurements, uh, this is probably not the video for you. Um, I'm going to leave some links in the description for videos that are a little bit more beginner friendly for how to read headphone measurements and sort of how to make sense of this, what we're talking about and why it's important. But um, with that video that we put out, it was a little bit like kind of letting a grenade go off within the headphone measurement enthusiast space. And so there were a lot of comments from you guys in the YouTube comments, but also on Reddit, on HeadFi, and other major forums. And so I wanted to address some of those comments and some of the questions in this video here. So with that out of the way, let's get started and dive right in. I think one of the most common questions that we got was, will we be remeasuring all the headphones that we've done in the past on the new b and 5128 system? And the answer to that is yes and no. We'll be remeasuring a lot of them, but there are definitely headphones from our back catalog that came from you know community members who sent them in for review or they were demo, demo units and we don't have them anymore. Um, and so those will sort of be filled in over time. But we do have every intention of measuring all the headphones that we have here on the new system right away. And just a note about that, as part of our measurement process, we're also going to continue to be measuring on the gross system here. And one of the reasons for that is we want to be able to see how headphones vary depending on the head, or the, in this case, the rig that it's on, uh, because I think that'll be interesting as well. So the answer there is yes, we will need to remeasure them, but they won't all be available right away. It was actually somewhat disappointing to see that, you know, there was a lot of misconceptions around what Harman is and, and sort of what the research is. And I think it's important that we distinguish between the Harman target that we're used to with this system here, the one that looks like this, and the Harman research generally that's, you know, a series of papers that are behind the Audio Engineering Society paywall. We, you know, we shouldn't blindly follow this stuff or be afraid to scrutinize it, but most of the time when I see most of the commentary that I see on the Harman target where it's, you know, I don't like the Harman target for one reason or another, it usually comes from a headline that somebody's read where it's clear that you know they haven't really bothered to go through and understand the point of the research. I think, if anything, the biggest failure of the Harman research is that they didn't do a good enough job communicating what's actually going on with the research. And because a lot of that is obscured by the publication model, um, it kind of falls to review platforms to try and communicate some of this. Um, which it feels like every day there are additional misconceptions about the research that you know we have to address. And so it'd be great if we didn't have to do that. But regardless, I want to make sure that it's clear that you know we do value the Harman research highly. And that's why it's still reflected in what we're doing with our target, um, even though the targets themselves look quite different from one another. So we could use diffuse field, but if we were to do that, we would also have to represent it, uh, a compensated measurement to diffuse field, with a tilt. And this is just a personal thing, but I, I feel that for new people, that's more of a barrier to get around, you know, to understand why there needs to be a tilt there, uh, rather than looking at you know how things measure relative to a flat line. I just think that that's easier for compensated measurements for new people. Uh, I could be wrong about that, but um, that's just sort of my sense there. Um, and because of that, we've decided to build the slope into the target. And if anybody's wondering, that's the slope that people preferred in speakers and in headphones. Again, we could do that, but there are a number of reasons why we think our method is better. Uh, first, it fits with, again, speaker perceptions a little bit better when you use a slope. The second is it's easier to understand variability around the target rather than having to deal with the shelf filters. And then the third is that it's just a simpler method. Now, if you're thinking ahead and you're wondering, well, wait, those two look different. Like the Harman target doesn't resemble a downward tilting slope DF. Uh, and you're right, it doesn't. But if you look at the base to treble delta between the two, it is actually the same. And this is sort of the point that the Harman target is only one way of achieving the the preference slope, the base to treble delta that people prefer. And this is just another way of doing that and a way that fits better with more of the speaker research and acoustic research that's out there. And just one other note on that, there is actually a paper that indicates people preferred the slope rather than a shelf 
for for this kind of thing. And that's actually from Dr. Olive as well. Um, so I think there's enough there to sort of ground or justify using a slope instead of a shelf filter, but there's nothing methodologically that prevents us from doing that. So the next question is, why don't we just show raw grass for everything? Wouldn't this make things simpler? Uh, we got this a lot. Um, and I think some people were actually joking <laughs> when they were suggesting this, um, hence the slash J in that comment. But the reason why we can't just use raw grass for everything is because if you took you know, this headphone and measured it on the grass here, and then you measured it on the B and K, and just showed raw measurements, those raw measurements would look different from one another. And so you need a rig specific reference point in order to make sense of any measurement. And so while we do intend to also provide raw measurements, the point about a target or having a target, rig specific target, isn't just to show compensated measurements. Now, with that said, and this may come as a surprise to many of you, but there's actually a very good argument in favor of showing compensated measurements as the default, even for people who are headphone enthusiasts or know how to read raw measurements. And it's because with compensated measurements, you avoid the parallel line illusion. Um, and effectively, it means that you have an easier time of actually identifying what the headphone's overall slope or tilt is, you know, whether it's warm, neutral, or bright, that kind of thing. And then also you have an easier time of understanding where various different deviations are from the target, where on a on a raw graph, you might have a harder time making that assessment given the parallel line illusion. So the bottom line there is that yes, it's important to show both at some level, but when it comes to a matter of what the defaults are, there's a compelling case to be made for compensated measurements. While showing Sennheiser HD 650 or 6XX measurements, you know, on the B and K5128 and using that as a reference point, might be useful for people who've heard that headphone. We want to make sure that this stuff is accessible to people who haven't. And then second of all, the HD650 also has a particular flavor or coloration to it. And so doing that doesn't really help us for evaluative purposes because it's just showing how something is relative to another thing that has a particular flavor to it, as do all headphones. And so that's why we need to have like a proper reference target in place you know, rather than just a well-known headphone. But I do get that it would be useful. It's just that that's not suitable for developing a reference curve. That is something that you could theoretically do, but there are a couple problems with this. One of them is that there'd be a certain amount of data noise from the individual headphones that are used, and then that would have to be carried forward for any future measurement rig that would be done or would be used. Now, it does seem like this idea or concept is what Harman has done internally for the development of their internal B and K5128 Harman target. But there are also additional issues with doing it that way, and they know this. Uh, but you know, you can't just do a one-to-one -one comparison between headphones measured on one rig and measured on the other rig, and then boom, there you go, there, there's your target. And then the reason for that is because headphones behave differently on different heads and also on different rigs. So you're never gonna get a one-to-one, -one, a perfect one-to-one -one comparison regardless. Now with Harman, it seems they've used this as kind of a stopgap or quick fix uh, to be able to you know, get some sort of data with the 5128 that is Harman-like. Uh, but that's not really suitable. That's not how you would go about, you know, actually developing a, a Harman reference curve for that system. Now, you could do it by calculating the Harman in-room response from diffuse field and then applying the shell filters, but that doesn't seem like what they've done. Can't you just EQ headphones on the Gross here to match Harman and then measure that same headphone on the BNK5128 and then there you go, there's your Harman target. And for the reason that I just mentioned, headphones behave differently on different heads. Because of that variation, Harman's own method or what it seems like what they've done there for the 5128 isn't going to work. Now, in addition to the methodological issues with doing it that way, there's also the downside of ending up with a highly smoothed result and we lose the high res option, which is one of the benefits of moving to the new system or just using the DF plus slope method in the first place. You know, one of the common critiques that we've had of the Harman target, and I think it's a valid one, is that the smoothing is, uh, you know, a little bit too high. So for those who are unfamiliar, the Harman target is smooth to one half octave. And I get why they did that for evaluative purposes, but at the same time, we've always wanted a more high res option there for reference curve and using diffuse field plus plus the slope allows us to do that. Um, so we would lose that if we then tried to somehow transpose the Harman target with EQ from this system here to the BNK5128 system. 
Now the next bit is to do with the BNK5128 itself. And there's been some commentary regarding the use of the mannequin head, how it's not necessarily more human-like or, you know, closer to an actual human for representing headphone measurements. So I want to talk about that a little bit. So what we can say definitively about the BNK5128 is that it is a much more accurate match to the acoustic impedance of a human ear, particularly in the lowest and then the highest frequencies, so below 200 hertz and above 10k. But this doesn't mean that it is a perfect representation of an average human or of an actual human, even though it is more human-like. Uh, what it does mean is that it is the best ear simulator currently available on the market today. And also it is pioneering the new headphone measurement standard. So that's really the, the reason to move towards that system. Now, if you're thinking about that graph that was posted by Dr. Olive to show, you know, that mannequin heads aren't necessarily, you know, more accurate of actu actual humans, uh, let's talk about that a little bit. This is something that anybody doing rigorous headphone testing and measuring needs to dive into. And we've been concerned with making sure that there is a good match between, you know, how a headphone is actually worn, like the position on the head, uh, and making sure that that matches the position on the rig. And if you look at the study that indicates that these mannequin heads aren't necessarily more accurate of humans, you can see that for at least two of them, there's some positional variance issues going on. In particular, the Kimar mannequin head and the Gross 45CA, which is effectively a, something kind of like this with this sort of plate, um, that they're supposed to match, right? Because they're using the same coupler in the same ear. But what that presentation showed is that there's some variation going on there with the positioning because the two that should be the Gross systems didn't match. So what we're thinking there is for our headphone measurements, Moving forward with the BNK5128, we're going to be evolving our in-ear microphone test process uh, so that we're making sure that when we do measure on the, the 5128, that it is in a, that it, the headphone is positioned in a way that matches with how it would be worn on the head or on an actual head. And the point of that is to make sure that the measurement you get is as representative as possible. So while the BNK5128 isn't a perfect human, uh, nobody is. <laughs> uh, we can do a little bit of work to bridge the gap between head and torso simulators and actual heads, human heads, uh, by using in-ear microphones. But that basically does it for this FAQ video. If you guys have additional questions or comments or concerns and you want to uh, you know, reach out and, and connect with me on stuff, um, join us on our Discord. That's the best way to do that. But you can also leave comments on the forum thread there. I'll link that in the description as well. That's where uh, we'll be responding. But yeah, that's it for me today. Uh, make sure you guys you know like, subscribe, do all those things. Um, and I will see you guys in the next one. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.